Hi, and welcome to The Horn, a podcast from International Crisis Group. I'm Alan Boswell. Last month, the Sudanese government signed a landmark peace deal, including with several Darfuri armed groups. Yet the one rebel group still fighting inside Darfur refused to join the peace talks and did not sign the peace deal. So to better understand why, we are speaking today with Julia Steers. Julia is a correspondent for Vice News, who has been based in the region for over five years. Earlier this year, Julia traveled to this rebel-held region of Darfur, the first foreign journalist to make it there in five years. She speaks to us about what she saw and heard there in an area largely cut off from the rest of the world. Julia, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. So you were the first foreign journalist um, to visit these rebel-held areas in Darfur in in five years, and the first one to do so with government permission in 10 years. Um, This area has essentially been cut off from the outside world for for years. So so what did you find when you got there? So yeah, we spent uh, quite a bit of time in Darfur in government-held territory before we crossed over into rebel-held territory. And despite having this permission from the government and sort of being in the post-revolution phase where the government said, you know, travel permits could be issued and you could go anywhere in the country, we still had a huge amount of logistical trouble actually crossing over into the first rebel-held town uh, in central Darfur. And, you know, we spent a few days going back and forth and going to different regional capitals to get permission from the military in addition to this permission that we had from Khartoum that proved to be somewhat meaningless once we got out there and really sort of drove home the extent to which all of Darfur was removed from Khartoum, removed from sort of this post-revolution period in a lot of ways. Uh, And when we actually got to Jebel Mara, which is sort of the last rebel-held territory in Darfur, we found a region that was really still in conflict to an extent that surprised me as well. You know, we talk a lot about sort of after the genocide and simmering conflict. You know, we heard gunfire every day. We experienced a lot of people who really still were processing very fresh trauma, who had been completely cut off, not only from the rest of Sudan, but even from the rest of Darfur. And, you know, as a journalist who's covered the region for five years and and who's covered a fair amount of conflict, I was still really taken aback by the extent to which, one, it still felt like an act of conflict, uh, and, and secondly, how traumatized people living there, civilians living there under rebel care still were. And how big is this area that we're talking about that is still rebel held? So the Jebel Mar Mountains sort of straddle central and southern Darfur, and it's really hard to say just exactly how many civilians are still living under rebel control. The rebels say tens of thousands of civilians. The UN, a U mission there, says that sounds close uh, to their estimates as well. But I really can't say enough how cut off this area has been. So it's been really difficult even for the UN who's on the ground there to get behind rebel-held lines, Um, certainly deep inside the mountain where a lot of civilians are living. So the rebels who we were with, who we had been working with for months to organize the trip, say tens of thousands of civilians are living under their control. And then in the broader area of central Darfur and Darfur, there's millions who are still living in the IDP camps that are sort of scattered all over the mountain. And uh, I'd encourage everyone to go watch the the, the short documentary you, you put together for Vice, because this area is also just incredibly stunning visually. Um, how are the, the people, the civilians who are there and cut off from everyone, how are they living? So they're living in villages that are under rebel protection. They are just sort of clustered close to some of the caves where... Uh, a lot of the bombings took place. So just for background, you know, the Jebel Mara Mountains were really uh, one of the key sites of the government-led 
bombing campaigns and and government-led attacks on the heartland of Darfur. So during the genocide and, and the war that followed, you had civilians sort of fleeing into and then higher and higher up the mountain, taking shelter from the aerial campaigns, from uh, what many have reported were chemical weapons attacks inside caves in this mountainous region and then inside these villages that they either built or built up during the conflict. There's no roads there. You're either walking, you know, we walked up to 20 miles a day some days. Uh, There are donkeys and camels for transport. There's no cell phone service. There's very minimal sat phone coverage. And people who are living there are living with a huge amount of trauma from the last 17 years of war. Uh, So people were really, really willing once they sort of saw that there were foreign journalists there or really any foreigner uh, to come out and tell their stories. It was a situation where we'd be inside somebody's home speaking to them. And then by the time we walked out of their home 30 minutes later, there would be 15 people from this small village outside the house with fragments of bombs or, you know, a child who they said had been affected by a chemical weapons attack, you know, people really wanting to share what had happened to them and also to hear about what was happening in the outside world. You know, obviously, the news of the revolution in Khartoum and the fall of al-Bashir had reached the area. But beyond that, they are really cut off from access to information. So there was also a real hunger for information from the outside, as well as um, an intense desire for people to know what's been happening there over the last decade and a half. Now, of course, the the context for this is that, you know, Sudan is undergoing this major political transition, which we've talked about a lot on this podcast with the fall of President Omar al-Bashir. And these fighters whose territory you visited, they are loyal to uh, the Sudan liberation movement led by Abdel Wahid al-Nur. There there are several uh, factions of this movement, but this is the one led by Abdel Wahid. And this uh, particular movement, this is the only rebel-held territory left in Darfur. And yet there was, you know, in the last month, a a major peace deal signed that included many armed groups in Darfur. um, And this particular group, even though it's the only one on the ground, is uh, not party to that deal and has refused to negotiate. Um, So, I mean, what did you find when talking to the actual fighters on the ground there, what they are fighting for? Does it seem like they were interested in joining a peace process? So the fighters on the ground and the civilians as well were certainly aligned with what Abdul Wahid has to say about his reason for sitting out from these peace deals. There were two previous peace deals, 2006 and 2011, um, with a lot of the same players. Obviously, that was under the al-Bashir regime. So the context has shifted, but the players remain the same. And they've seen no substantial change on the ground. And when you're sort of just hearing statements from Abdul Wahid saying nothing has changed, it's easy to sort of question his motivations when he's one of the only holdouts from the peace talks. But when you're on the ground, you can really understand why they're so skeptical of the peace process. So the main things that Abdul Wahid has to say about what will bring him to the bargaining table is that he wants to see demonstrable change on the ground first in terms of humanitarian access, in terms of disarming the militia groups previously known as the Janjaweed, and dealing with the condition of the millions who are still displaced from the ongoing conflict. So The rebels really towed the party line in terms of saying they want to see justice, they want to see substantial change on the ground, they would like some very basic humanitarian uh, services provided to the region under their control. All of that being said, and despite the fact that they all really had quite personal stories of, you know, joining the rebels because their village was attacked or their family was killed in really horrific and brutal ways... I also got the sense that once Abdul Wahid engages and once there is some substantial change on the ground, um, they're willing to put down their arms. They're willing to come down from the mountain. I didn't get the sense that these are people who who want to be, you know, even lifelong soldiers. Uh, so, you know, I think there's sort of a duality of both you have real, real conflict fatigue and, you know, 
deeply held trauma, which sort of leads them to want to end things. But of course, in terms of what they were saying, they were really aligned with Abdul Wahid in terms of wanting change on the ground first. The other thing that came up again and again, and this was both on the mountain and in IDP camps, is the fact that you know, the peace talks are being le- led from the government side by a hugely problematic character in Hameti, who's the leader of the Rapid Support Forces. There's, uh, you know, a lot of skepticism, and I would say probably well-founded skepticism, about a process that is being led by the man who was sort of the mastermind of the genocide against them. Yeah, like you said, uh, one of the demands, if it is, you know, that the the John Jaweed be disarmed, as uh, Abdul Wahid puts it, uh, would, you know, you, you could see how that could be quite a challenge considering the role that that Hameti uh, plays in the in, in the government. I mean, the flip side of it, of course, is is that, you know, when they say nothing has changed, of course, the, the counter argument would be that you can't change anything until you uh, actually commit to peace talks and negotiate an end to the conflict. So is it is it clear to you, like what a path towards entering peace talks would look like? So I think one, again, I the issue of Hamedi, and not only Hamedi, but uh, you know Al Burhan, who's who leads on the military side in the Sovereign Council, he's someone who sort of cut his teeth in in Western Darfur early in the conflict. The other leaders of the RSF who are still in place, you know, they're they're not sort of theoretical characters to to the rebels or to many Darfuris like they are to others who participated in the in the revolution. They're people who they know from specific attacks on villages. So this issue of justice takes on, I think, a deeper meaning for them in that they want to see actual strides toward justice before they engage in the peace process. So I think that's hugely important to them as well. Um, you know, I'm not an analyst, but I but I will say in terms of one sort of tangible thing that could change on the ground uh, to get Abdul Wahid and to get some of his, you know, both civilians and rebels on his side uh, invested in the peace process, I would say, is making a real genuine effort to disarm some of these previously government-backed militias and to stop the attacks that are still ongoing. So one of the things that shocked me the most in talking to IDPs is that any time they left the camp uh, to go farming, to go sort of check on their plot at the village where they came from, they were getting attacked. So there's tons of small scales attacks attacks that we would hear about, you know, their donkeys being killed just sort of by armed militias or armed uh, individuals on camelback or horseback. And of course, to them, they were using the term John Jaweed to describe uh, the perpetrators of all of these attacks. And in addition to those smaller scale skirmishes um, that are happening, you know, on a weekly, certainly monthly basis, there have been really big attacks where at best government forces are sort of standing, standing idly by and at worst they're complicit in participating in the attack. So there was an attack at an IDP camp a few – about a week before we arrived – um, and then, you know, just last month in July, there was another attack in Darfur that, you know, you have dozens injured, you have several people killed in all of these attacks, you have people who are being even further displaced from displacement camps. So, you know, when I say you get the sense that there is still active conflict ongoing, that's not just on the mountain in rebel-held territory. Uh, you know, every IDP who we spoke to had a story that was quite recent about dealing with these ongoing clashes. And then every few months, we're still hearing about these sort of larger scale attacks that many of the civilians say the RSF or, um, you know, RSF backed militias are participating in. So I think from a civilian perspective, if you saw that calm down in the coming months, you could make an argument that, you know, returning to your land or engaging in the peace talks is a more reasonable thing for those um, who are still sort of in Abdul Wahid's camp. And is it clear exactly who is still doing these attacks, who these militias are in Darfur? 
So, like I said, the civilians and the IDPs there really use the term John Jaweed all the time still. And I know that's something that the RSF really bristles at because they're trying to move away from that image of being associated with the John Jaweed, who's the militia who perpetrated the attacks during the genocide. Um, the UNAU mission there very often calls it tribal clashes. Um, and there's a whole sort of world of complex dynamics between some of these Arab and other Darfuri tribes. Um, what most people will agree on is that these are, you know, there's an escalation of tribal conflict there that's a direct result of um, the dynamics established by the previous government during the genocide and the conflict period. Uh, and that a lot of these arms are coming either from the government under al-Bashir or from the RSF. It's fair to say that the region is really awash in weapons and that without a real commitment to disarmament and digging into these tribal militias that still exist there and are still making IDPs feel so insecure, it, it will be very difficult to reestablish anything that seems like peace. And of course, the, the peace deal that was signed, although it doesn't include Abdel Wahid's group, it does include um, uh, other other armed movements in Darfur and and set up some of these SSR processes, um, set up uh, measures for IDPs to begin returning to their homes. Have you been able to be in touch with, with people on the ground since this was signed? Um, I know it was very recent, but have you been able to gauge a reaction on, you know, if, if there's still a, a lot of skepticism uh, that these, these things will be implemented? You know, from the IDP perspective, as they said to me six months ago, they've said the same thing this week, which is that to them it is you know, really sort of preposterous that they would return to their homes. When they leave the camps to do farming and just sort of go beyond the confines of the camp, they're feeling um, really at risk of being attacked. And then there's also, you know, a bit of just fear from hearing about the attack at the camp over. So when when we were there, there had been attack at um, in Al Janena at a refugee camp there that displaced tens of thousands. And I think until these violent attacks in or just outside IDP camps end, they will not feel um, like returning to their homes is is a reasonable thing. And, and the other thing to note that they're certainly aware of, and, and there's a lot to be said about the efficacy of the UN mission over the years there, but the UN mission is set to draw down. Uh, and, and in many ways, when you have the RSF and government forces and the UN being sort of the only players on the ground there offering security, you know, the IDPs sort of feel like the UN is their last line against RSF and, and local militias. And the drawdown, I think, has had a very destabilizing effect, at least mentally, on a lot of the IDPs that I have talked to in terms of feeling safe, both inside the camp, by the way, and then, of course, in terms of returning home as well. Is it clear when you talk to these IDPs and their and their leaders in Darfur how much connection there is between them and Abdul Wahid's group, but also the whole host of other armed groups that were negotiating this peace deal in Juba? So certainly there are political dynamics going on inside the camp and sort of former rebels living inside the camp. Um, obviously, those living in the camp are, are ones who have put down their weapons and who are aligned with many of the of the leaders who were engaging in the talks. When we were there, the talks were sort of just in their beginning. And I kept asking, you know, what do you think about what's happening in Juba, where, where the negotiations were taking place? I would say that was sort of across the board met with skepticism, despite the fact that their leaders uh, were engaging. There's a real sense of we'll believe it when we see it. And we've been through this before. While al-Bashir is no longer the face of the government side of the peace deals, the other leaders, Hamedi included, still are the same characters, deeply familiar characters to many of the civilians in, in Darfur. So there was sort of a resigned sense of, you know, if the peace deal brings change here and if things improve for us, then great, but we're not holding our breath. You were also able to talk to the rapid support forces on the ground. Uh, what, what did they say? 
you know, the RSF is really keen to sanitize their image and any involvement that they had on the ground in the genocide. They have been mounting a a pretty serious PR campaign since the fall of al-Bashir. And what they told us is that they are not the Janjui, they are not tribal militias, that they are protecting IDPs. Um, we interviewed the head of operations for the RSF, who is comes from Darfur and has a lot of experience on the ground there. And he said, you know, they're very focused on building wells and building roads there. So he was sort of billing them as doing humanitarian and development work. So to say that sort of what the RSF is framing themselves at as um, and what many Darfuris see them as, to say that there's a disconnect there, I, I think is an understatement. But certainly they're they're keen to sort of position themselves as not a party to the conflict, either previously and certainly currently. Now, Abdel Wahid, he's been in Europe for a, a very long time. He lives in Paris. I believe you've actually met him there. One of the questions that constantly comes up is people wonder how much control he actually maintains on the ground. Now, you said that his fighters, you know, are very much maintaining the sort of top-down messaging. But did you get a sense of, of of just, you know, how loyal they are, how much he is still in charge of everything that's going on on his rebel-held territory? Right. So there are certainly some grumblings in the upper echelons, both of his own movement and then definitely, you know, among RSF leadership that he's disconnected from the cause and that he's only looking out for his own interests and sort of not not really helping his people by staying out of the peace talks. You know, he he is literally disconnected from the movement just as because I said communications is so extremely difficult there. You know, it's not like he can just sort of call up his guys on the mountain. Uh, but he is very, you know, in in close contact with um, other leaders of the movement who are in Kampala, with with leaders uh, who come down from the mountain to talk with him. And, you know, I think he is very disconnected from day to day life in Jabal Mara. I think that's um, sort of just a fact based on that he that he's been in France. But all that being said, You know, I met with him in Paris in June of last year in order to sort of start the process of getting final permissions to go to the mountain in the first place. We had to pre-approve our team and our translator by him. And then, you know, when we showed up to rebel-held territory and finally crossed over, he had changed his mind about the translator. Suddenly the translator had become a, a problematic figure for him. So, you know, he he was approving who could go up the mountain from our own team and, um, you know, clearly still sort of looms large, at least in the consciousness of a lot of the rebels there. And, and the communication is trickling down enough that even the sort of foot soldiers who we were talking to, the lower level guys, were able to say that they wanted essentially what he's been saying, which is, you know, just as humanitarian access and and real change in central Darfur. And Abdul Wahid, as we mentioned, uh, he's he's sort of famously intransigent. He's he's refused to even participate in peace talks for for many years. You know, after after the the revolution in Sudan and the new government, in which it looked like this might be a a, a new chapter in this in this in this very long long saga. Uh, Abdul Wahid met with Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdok, um, and you know there were hopes that the stance of refusing to to negotiate would would uh, come to an end. I know we touched on this earlier, but in many ways it does seem to be the sort of uh, a major crux of the of the entire discussion. Which is, is it really clear what his strategy is moving forward, and 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 why did this progress flame out? So it's true that there was this progress made. He met with Hamduk and, you know, they both sort of said they thought it would be a short meeting and then it ended up being an hours long meeting. Um, you know, but all along Abdul Wahid, you know, is 
is nothing if not consistent, even if he's, you know, become known as a bit of a prickly character. He said at the time that he was meeting Hamduk, but he was not meeting him as a as a prime minister. He was meeting him just sort of as a political figure, um, which sort of was him underscoring his point that he doesn't think that the current government is legitimate because it has so many sort of hangovers of the al-Bashir regime and that he's ready to engage once there's a real civilian government in place and once the transition to democracy seems genuine from his side of things. And so there is still a lot of back channeling going on and certainly there's more engagement from him than we've seen in the past, but it's it's certainly baby steps and I think that was really highlighted again by his reaction to the peace deal this week which um you know he said to him it's the same as the two previous agreements it still doesn't address the root causes of the conflict. Um, and sort of pushing for the same for the same things that he's been pushing for all along. So you know there was a lot of sort of international positivity around this deal, and you know without fail, everybody who celebrated the signing this week also said, by the way, it's it's really time that Abdul Wahid engages. So the international community is certainly linked on that message. And then you know whether or not we we see Abdul Wahid budge at all in the weeks and months to come is um, I think is anybody's guess. All right. I think we'll close it up there. So thanks, Julia, for for coming on our podcast. Thanks for having me, Alan. Thanks for listening. We'll be back in two weeks with our next episode. To learn more about International Crisis Group and our work on the Horn of Africa, visit our website at crisisgroup.org or follow us on Twitter at crisisgroup. Once again, I'm Alan Boswell, and this episode was produced by Mae Francis.